What's up, Read My Mind Radio family? Yo soy Tomaso, Thomas Reed, host and producer of this podcast, Read My Mind Radio. Welcome to those of you who are new here. This podcast introduces you to compelling people impacted by all degrees of blindness and disability. Every now and then, like today's episode, I share some of my own thoughts and experiences as a man adjusting to becoming blind as an adult. And yes, I say adjusting. I don't think I'll ever really use the ED suffix on adjust. That's not to mean that there's no progress. It's just a continuous journey. Once you get to the understanding that it's not one to be feared or even think negatively about, it gets better. But it's like life. There's always going to be change. And vision loss or any disability is now a part of that. If that's part of your reality, a family member or a friend, or maybe people you work with, well, you're definitely in the right place. If you yourself are going through some other life change, or maybe you just like podcasts, there's something here for you too, if you're open to that. Everyone is truly welcome here, with the exception of those with hate in their heart. Energy works in mysterious ways, and I don't want that negativity being passed along to me or any of the family. So let's get this popping. Today, I'm sharing some thoughts about this podcast. These are not stream of consciousness. There's no way I would do that to you. You see, my mind can be a scary place when I'm trying to figure things out. Chances are, as I navigate these thoughts, they'll prove to be applicable to more than this podcast and maybe useful to others. That's exactly how I feel about every episode. I focus on those adjusting to blindness, but lots of others can relate and enjoy. Since I began this podcast, and maybe prior, I've been very specific about saying I don't see myself as a journalist. I'm an advocate, straight up. If you listen to the podcast, you know there's a certain message about blindness and disability. It's a recent loss and it's tough and you're struggling. It's a good excuse to get out. It's a good excuse to start thinking about things you can do. Disability experience, experience of marginalization, an experience of self-empowerment and autonomy and decision-making. There are people who definitely look at all the activists of social media as sacred rates, not as real, that you're not as hard because your bodies are on the line. I think there's all kinds of methods and each one of them are valuable. My opinion or feelings in most cases are evident. The overall message is one of empowerment. I'm not impartial, as if journalism is really impartial. There are times, though, when I need to make all sorts of journalistic decisions. It could be the way I edit or the specific questions I ask, even the overall feel of the show, the sound design. It's intentional. My approach is different from your standard so-called impartial reporter. I'm connected to most people who are guests on the podcast. Usually the connection isn't personal. Rather, it's through blindness and disability. Sometimes it could be race or we have something else in common. I feel a responsibility to both my guests and listeners. I want my guests to feel what I hear when they tell me their stories. I want them to know I respect them and their experience. I want listeners to find the multiple ways that they relate to my guests. Yes, there's the disability experience, but maybe they share a similar motivation, a desire, a goal. That's what I want. It doesn't mean I can always make it happen. Every listener brings their own past, prejudices, preconceptions, and experiences to the podcast. That makes sense. It's like anything else. Two people hear the same song, see the same film or read the same book and have drastically different interpretations. Some people see a reflection of their own lives and goals while others never see themselves in a podcast where blindness and disability is so prevalent. It's probably not one or the other. I think there are some who have a bit of both. Either way, 
I can't control that. Which leads me to a statement. You should always remember there are people worse off than you. No matter how you're sad and blue, there's always someone who has it worse than you. So many people. If you're having a bad day, just consider the day Nick Black. Bear in mind that there's always someone worse off than you. Not talk, not see. For the health and strength that I have For there's someone worse off than I am That's bad. First things first. I'm pretty sure I said this same thing at some point in my life. It's a common statement and an accepted way of thinking. But what does it really mean? How can you compare someone's life and happiness without all the information? Is this really pity? As a content producer, I cringe when I hear it now, especially in relation to my podcast. There's never been a guest on Read My Mind Radio that's in need of someone's pity. I then start to question the choices that I made for the episode. Did I present this person in a way that says they should be pitied? I don't think I focus on the illness side of things. I do include or mention it mainly because others with the same diagnosis can relate. It can also serve as a way to normalize illness and disability. They're a part of life and not a mysterious thing that happens to one person. Am I creating inspiration porn? Most of you are probably familiar with that term. It's the idea of presenting people with disabilities as inspiration solely or in part on the basis of their disability. This idea that this person's story, which often you don't even get, well, it should inspire you or just give you that warm, fuzzy feeling, reminding you that most of the world is so considerate. Watch as the rest of the high school students cheered on as the coach let the so-called special needs student in the game for the last 20 seconds. Comes to practice every day. Um, he shoots with them. He cheers them on. A well, very a special student indeed, all thanks to the compassion of one of his classmates. But the emotion of this night involved a student who cannot take the field, but is universally admired for his determination. A special needs student with Williams syndrome. He's a fixture on the sidelines during football games, always rooting on the team. But high fives are one thing. Senior prom, something different. She could have picked anybody to go to prom with her. I just don't want to put that sort of thing out in the world. Does it sound like I'm making a big deal out of this? Maybe because I've seen inspiration porn live and in full effect. In fact, I unknowingly was recruited to be a part of the performance. I do have a story. Very good story. Now, I know you get this line all the time, but I think you'll like the story. Many years ago, when I was still very new to blindness, I was asked by a local organization serving those with vision loss to give an access technology demo during an event. I took to the technology pretty quickly, and they thought I could be helpful sharing that information. There was no money involved, of course, but they provided my transportation, and I think there was going to be a lunch. I was set up, y'all. Arriving at the center, I was shown to the main room where the event was taking place. There were three or four individuals with vision loss seated in the front of the room. The rest of the group was seated around a large conference table. I was shown to a table in the front of the room off to a side where I set up my laptop. Shortly after, the host of the event, the director of the center, welcomed the guests and kicked off the agenda. Each of the men and women seated in the front of the room were asked to share the story of their vision loss. Here's how I recall that part. Each individual told their story while the event host accentuated the misery. Storyteller. Before I went blind, I used to take long walks in the park. Now, I can't see anything. My whole world is dark. Host, pitch black, the world is dark. Too dangerous for you in the park. (laughs) 
I said that's how I recall it today. But that's not exactly what happened. <laughs> but I do recall the questions and comments from the host were obviously selected to highlight the negative. She was playing to the fear of the guests seated around the conference table. These were potential donors. All who probably already had beliefs about blindness. It's probably, it's probably the, the worst, worst thing that could ever happen to you. And if we don't help these poor people, they won't be able to do anything. They can't do for themselves. I was set up to be a part of a dog and pony show to help fundraise for the organization. The fact that it was a fundraiser isn't a problem for me. I would have still agreed to attend. However, I would not have participated if I was aware of their approach to raise that money. My so-called presentation was probably less than five minutes. The host asked some specific questions and then made it seem like it was my technology background that enabled me to grasp the tools and less about the technology as a tool for independence. Then they pulled out the glasses. No, 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 not drinks. I don't even think that would have helped. Nah, it was the blindness simulation glasses. These are created to help sighted people understand what it supposedly looks like when you have certain diseases like macular degeneration, RP, glaucoma, and others. At first thought, you may think, okay, that's probably helpful. It helps people understand and therefore empathize. Sympathize? Well, in this particular case, while the dog and ponies sat up in front, and this one off to the side a bit, the sighted donors were led into their temporary world of vision loss. Reluctantly at first, one after the other, each slowly began trying on the glasses. Oh my. Wow. Oh my. Wow. Where did you go, Jeannie? And then the real fun began as they exchanged glasses with one another, laughing as they realized how little they could actually see, unable to find things they placed on the conference table, the host joking as she moved their cups of coffee. Meanwhile, the dogs and ponies sat up front while the jackasses continued with their disability experiment. Empathy? I didn't see that, but a check was written. I don't remember how the event finally ended, but I do know that was it for me. I checked out. There may have been some additional conversation, but I doubt I had much to say to anyone after bearing witness to that display of ableism. I vowed to never be a part of anything even remotely like that. I could easily imagine each of the donors around the table going home fulfilled and thinking, I should really count my blessings because there's always someone worse off in the world. As far as I could tell, I was alone in my review of this event. I believe some of the others continued to participate. I pretty much severed ties and ended up having a sort of reputation. So I was never asked again. Perfect. All of this leads to my final question. How are we telling our own stories? I highly doubt any of the people sharing their story were given instructions on how to tell it. Chances are, the director simply knew that these individuals would supply what she wanted for this audience. Some may say the ends justify the means. The center received the money and therefore can do good things for the clientele. I don't agree. I believe several of those in the room were employers in positions to someday maybe hire a blind person. I doubt they would. But that's a subject for another day. What thought do you put into telling your own story? In most instances, we're doing the telling of our own stories. We don't have a videographer, podcaster, journalist. We're probably not standing in front of an audience equipped with a PowerPoint presentation. We're simply talking to people, most often one-on-one. -on -one. Crazy thing, I tell other people's stories, but not my own. I can do it in a presentation, no doubt. But one-on-one, -on -one, not so much. I feel strange. I should tell my story as if I was given a presentation. It's mine. It's a good one. It's worth telling. It can be helpful. And it's the only one I have. And in the event someone hears it, 
And their thought is, wow, I'm so grateful because I'm not like Thomas. Here we go. My response, bruh, you should be so lucky. I'm not flexing or being conceited or anything like that. But this is my life. Why shouldn't I be proud of what I do, when I do it and how I do it? The same decisions I make for my guests and you all, the listener, shouldn't I put that much time into my own story? If you say yes, then maybe you too should do the same. I told you this wouldn't just be related to podcasting. In fact, it's not just related to disability. Or is it? You can find Read My Mind Radio wherever you get podcasts. And if for some reason that isn't the case, like Teddy says, come on over to my place, readmymind.com. That's all to the E I D. Like my last name. Peace.